right, opening the Word of God can change us. We need to prepare our hearts. Let's just say a quick prayer. Father God, as we have worshipped, we now gather around your Word. I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, would be acceptable in your sight and helpful for all of us, that all of us together, with ears to hear, eyes to see, and hands and feet to put into practice, will carry out your Word. For we pray all this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Do you believe that we live in an age of truth decay? I didn't say tooth decay. Truth decay. An erosion of the foundation of truth, a blurring of the lines of what is true and what is false in our day. If you believe that, you're not alone. Um, There are a number of people who are increasingly believing that. A secular think tank... A secular think tank, the Rand Corporation, published a book based on their research in 2018. And they define this phenomena as, quote, the diminishing role of facts and analysis in American public life. I guess they spent some time on Facebook. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was, that was my editorial. But um, Christian thinker and philosopher Douglas Ruthis is concerned as well. He wrote a book before them in 2000, um, and he called his book Truth Decay also. And here's what he said. It's subtitled, Defending Christianity Against the Challenges of Postmodernism. I'll explain that in a second. But here's how he defines truth decay. He says, truth decay is a cultural condition in which the very idea of absolute, objective, and universal truth is considered implausible, held in contempt, and not even seriously considered. Absolute truth is cast aside in our culture. Um, Here's how I like to explain it, and I want to explain it by use of a baseball analogy since we've got about 45 days to the start of spring training, but who's counting? Kirby Anderson of Probe Ministries uses this analogy of the three umpires to explain how our world is is seeing truth now and how it's evolved over the centuries. Three different views of balls and strikes corresponding to three different views of truth in our day. The first umpire says, there's balls and there's strikes and I call them the way they are. Second umpire says, There's balls and there's strikes, and I call them the way I see them. Third umpire says, there's balls and strikes, and they ain't nothing until I call them. Some of them must be in the Angel Hernandez School of Umpiring, but, ooh, I'm sorry. The first view is what what is called uh, pre-modernism. It's... It's what the ancients believed for 2,000 years, that there is objective truth. And the umpire is to see that and to call it the way it really is. Like it really is a ball or a strike. And you call it a ball if it's a ball. And you call it a strike, it's a strike. If it's true, you call it true. If it's false, you call it false. But this second view has been developing since the Enlightenment, since the Scientific Revolution. And it's brought some tremendous changes to our society, some for good. Science has brought some change. But this whole idea of verifying things and proving things. And so this view of modernism is, is to reject a belief in God because we can't verify him. We can't put him in a test tube and, and, and confirm that he's really there. And so, so it's the way I see it. And if I can't see it, if I can't touch it, if I can't taste it, then it's not true. This is the situation that we have through the centuries. But that's even gone, it's gone further now into what's called postmodernism. And what is that view? That view is truth is not discovered. It's not like we find it. Truth is just created. I call it true if I want it to be true. That's the kind of state that we're in in our day. And so before you just dismiss all this as just mere intellectual things, what's Alex saying, going off, trying to make it sound good with baseball, truth and all that, how does that relate to my life? I want you to listen to a the Truth Project video, just a short video, that discusses what's at stake around the issue of truth. 
A man approached me and told me the sky was green and gravity didn't exist to him. He believed it with the utmost sincerity, then took off his tinted glasses, was overwhelmed with the blue sky, and <laughs> fell down a flight of stairs. Yeah, such is the nature of belief and truth. Although he wholeheartedly believed what he believed and perceived it to be truth, did it actually alter the truth? Did it change reality? Did his ardent opinion and sincere acceptance of a non-existent gravitational force prevent him from falling? Can there really be your truth and my truth? What happens when our truths are contradictory? Is truth pliable? Well, I guess it all depends on what truth is. Can it really be this postmodernistic, relativistic, non-reality-based ism so many incorrectly wish it to be? Oh, if it is, then you couldn't actually understand that sentence. I'm just saying. Perhaps the definition has been blurred a bit and needs to be brought back into focus. The dictionary says truth is that which is in accordance with fact and reality. So truth is what is. It's what's real. The kind of truth Aristotle and Jesus spoke of. Now, here you go. Let's say somebody tells you they saw Millie Buggins inside an elevator, and someone else told you that at the exact same time, in the exact same relationship, they saw the exact same Millie Buggins, and he was completely outside of the elevator. Can both be true? Something is either true or it's not, right? It doesn't matter where you're from or your life experiences. It doesn't change the facts because truth isn't relative or based on your perception. If it were, then it would be limited to the speaker's point of view, which would mean truth is different from person to person. Therefore, it would only be binding or relevant to the person or group of persons who perceive it that way. So then a 10-ton bag of bricks could fall on one person and squash them, and the same bag of bricks could fall on another person and would just bounce off. You see, it all depends on how they perceive truth. Bag of bricks, in this case, is relative to either a real bag of bricks or a bouncing ball. You pick. Next example. Okay, let's say you ask Jimmy here where the nearest hospital is. Do you want a real answer or whatever Jimmy's relative answer might be? Huh, I bet you want the real one. Next one. Big Louie. Okay, that guy right there. He accuses you of theft, but you didn't do it. Are you going to defend the truth or just tell the judge nobody can really know what truth is as they put you in very real handcuffs and they walk you to a very real prison? Takes me to John chapter 18 where Jesus tells Pilate he came to testify to the truth and that everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus. Nothing relative there. There are those on the side of truth and those who aren't. Jesus repeatedly said, I tell you the truth, to open his statements because reality of the what is kind is what we need to live our lives by and what we expect others around us to live theirs by. Truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's either true or it's not. See, truth does matter. Truth matters for our lives. Truth matters for our eternities. And so today, as we continue this sermon series in, in 2 Thessalonians, we're going to be in chapter 2 today, and we're going to think about how we can stand firm. That's the big theme of 2 Thessalonians. Stand firm in the face of truth decay. We're going to see today that we're, we're, we're going to have to stand firm in an increasing age that's exchanging truth for falsehood. How do we stand firm? That's the question that we'll, we'll think about today as there's a growing tooth decay, I said it, truth decay in our day. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians, and I want to just walk you through the passage real quickly and then step right into some of the key issues that we see in this passage. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is a chapter written to assure its readers in the first century and us today to not become too uneasily settled by things going on around us. And it teaches specifically about the return of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So to prepare God's people for all this, Paul writes this chapter. Listen to what Paul says in the beginning of chapter 2, and verses 1 through 3. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Paul doesn't want them to be unsettled or alarmed, unsettled this idea of almost like shaking, like in an earthquake. He says, don't, don't be deceived. And then he explains in, in verses 4 through 12, what will precede the second coming of Jesus Christ? Because they had been told that the coming had already happened and they had missed out. And they were alarmed by that. And Paul says, no, no, no. I don't care who told you that. It won't happen the second coming of jesus won't happen until and he gives us two key things that will happen before the coming of jesus look at what paul says 
in verses 4 through 12. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that they will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. So Paul tells them that some things are coming and that they they need to be ready for it. And he identifies two things. He says the first thing in the first part of verse 3 is, until the rebellion comes. We'll talk about that today. And then he says the second thing, a man of lawlessness or the Antichrist is revealed. And we'll talk about that, not today. We want to focus in on that first one. What is Paul talking about? The rebellion occurs. Paul is saying that, that this is going to happen before the return of Jesus Christ. What does that look like? And then Paul says, as he finishes out this chapter in verses 13 through 17, these things are coming, but here's what we're to do. You want to hear what you're to do? You're to stand firm in the truth. Look at what Paul says. Stand firm in the truth. Verse 13, but we always ought to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits. He saved you through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called us to this gospel that we might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, and this is the key verse of the entire book, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed, every good deed and word. So what are we to do in the face of truth decay? What are we to do in the face of increasing pressure around us to to put off truth and to accept whatever is fashionable in our day. Here's what we're to do. Even in times of truth decay, we stand firm by being saved and strengthened by the truth until Christ comes. That's what I want to think with you about today. Look at this passage again in chapter 2 and verse 3. What is Paul talking about? He says, before the Lord returns, one thing will happen. This is one of two. And notice this first one is, and that day, that day of Jesus' appearing will not come until what? The rebellion occurs. It's the Greek word apostia. We get our English word apostasy from. You ever hear the word apostasy? It's in our dictionary. comes from Greek and Latin. And if you look in the dictionary, it says an act of refusing to continue to follow, obey, or recognize a religious faith. It's a falling away from an established faith. It's an abandonment of a previous loyalty. And so that's why the... New International Version and the English Standard Version translates that as the rebellion. Looked at some other translations, even going back years and years. You look back at the earliest English translation, the Wycliffe Bible translation. It goes all the way back to the late 1300s. And the way that this, this phrase is translated is, but dissension comes first. 
the Geneva Bible from the 1500s, except a departing comes first. And, and there are some Bible teachers out there, you look on the internet, and there's some respected Bible teachers that say, ah, departing, this is referring to a physical departure from the earth, you know, the rapture. And while that's taught in the scripture, I don't think this is at all what Paul's talking about. And that's why your, your more contemporary translations, the New King James Version, unless the falling away comes first, or as we see in the NIV and the English Standard Version, until the rebellion occurs. A, a falling away must occur before Jesus Christ returns. And we see this clearly taught in Scripture. If you go through various passages of the New Testament, in particular Paul's letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Paul gives instructions, careful instructions about what is going to come. So for instance, in 1st Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Then goes on to explain what will happen and how we are to guard against it. He speaks also about this in 2 Timothy several times. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he speaks about this as well. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And he goes on to describe the characteristics of people in the last days. And he says in verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power. That's what's going to characterize Life in the last days. Are we in the last days? We've been in the last days for 2,000 years, but we're in the latter stage of the last days before Christ's return. We don't know when, but we're getting closer. Will we see more of this? Paul would say, it's probably true. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul also speaks about this as well. He says, a pastor should be preaching the word in season and out of season. Why? Why do we focus on the Word of God? Why do we spend time opening up the Bible and spending a, a half hour or more studying it? Because Paul says, preach the Word because a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will want what their itching ears want to hear. And they will turn aside. They will fall away. And then, of course, in the passage that we read and we're looking at today, Paul is saying that one of the things that this man of lawlessness that we'll look at in detail in a, in a coming message or so, what will he do? Look at, look at our passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Notice that one of the things that the man of lawlessness does is turn people aside from truth to error. Look at what it says in Verse 9 again, just to acquaint ourselves with this. Verses 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. How does Satan work from the very beginning? Remember in the garden, what does he say? Is this is what God says? I don't think so, Satan said. And so he's been doing that ever since, right? This is what the man of lawlessness will do. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie the lie, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the, church, the, the truth and be saved. So if we don't love the truth, if we don't believe the truth, we could be deceived. The Bible says a time of falling away is coming. How is that supposed to work? How is that supposed to work? How is that working? I mean, just look around. Just look around and observe. There's been and continues to be a falling away from biblical teaching. Straight biblical teaching. There continues and will be a falling away from biblical practice. It's around us. Let me give you something to think about. How many of you would like to go to this school how many of you, you say, I'm, I'm done with school? How many of you would like your, grand, uh, your grandchildren to go to this school or your kids to go to this school? Here's a couple rules. I'm going to read them to you. Here's the first rule of this school. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies. 
is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. John 17, 3. How many of you would like to go to that school or send a kid there? That sounds like a thoroughly biblically centered school, doesn't it? I'll read to you a couple of other rules for the students. Let everyone so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Pretty hard, right, to maintain that. Um, here's another rule. That they studiously redeem the time, observe the general hours, hours, diligently attend the lectures without any disturbance by word or gesture. Um, it goes on and on. And it says, finally, if any scholar shall be found to transgress any of these laws of God or the school, he may be admonished at the public monthly meeting. Wow, it's pretty strong stuff, huh? What school is this, you might ask? It's Harvard University. Founded as it was, the motto of Harvard University in 1692, all knowledge without Christ is, was vain in Christ to his glory. This is Harvard's founding documents. This is Harvard's founding principles. Harvard was founded to be a school to train people to know and love the truth in Jesus Christ. On the campus today, there's a stone which signifies the founding of the school. And it's maybe hard to read on the screen, but it says, After God had carried us safe to New England and we had builded our houses, little old English, and provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government, one of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity, dreading to leave an illiterate minister to the churches when our present minister shall lie in the dust. What was the purpose of the founding of Harvard University? The first 10 of 12 presidents were ministers themselves, it was to train godly ministers to serve the churches of New England. Yes, Harvard University in its founding. Can you say it has fallen away from its initial founding? It's still a great school, secular speaking. I'm not, if anyone has gone there or will go there, I, I'm not saying it's an Ivy League school. But it has certainly fallen away from its founding principles, hasn't it? And, and the school's motto is all about truth. Truth for Christ and his church. Truth unites, but yet truth has been abandoned. It's been abandoned in teaching. It's been abandoned in practice. And we can see that around us, can't we? We can see that around us, how sometimes churches have outright abandoned church and scriptural teaching. Can you think of any situations that you've encountered where that's happened? Maybe in some of the ways in which the ancient prayers, the prayers of Jesus even in the scripture, are Father who art in heaven, and now we have churches today that are saying what? gender-inclusive language to our prayers, right? Changing the way things are said. There, we have always affirmed for thousands of years that it is by Christ's death on the cross, His sacrificial death for us, He paid the penalty for us, that we have salvation. And yet in many seminaries today, what is being taught to believe in a God who would send His Son from heaven to earth to die on the cross for the sins of the world. One scholar called it cosmic child abuse. Crazy stuff. A falling from the truth of doctrine and biblical teaching. But it's also a falling from biblical practice. We, we see that. Went to a church website the other day and... You see the statement of faith? Pretty similar to ours. Not much of a difference. Except for the fact on their website, they say very clearly, we fly the pride 
flag. So while teaching-wise, they haven't denied, at least in theory, in practice, denying something that's been taught by church and by church leaders and by the Bible for two millennia. This is the age we live in. I'm not trying to um, make it any worse than it is or paint it wrongly. If anything, I'm trying to be a little temperate. But we live in this kind of age. And, 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 and why is this happening? Well, in some way it's happening because Christ said, there'll be many who in my name will proclaim wrong things. Paul says there'll be a falling away. The Bible says that until Jesus comes, before Jesus comes, there will be a rebellion. Now, I don't want to say that true Christians can lose their salvation, but this is the institutional church as a whole, and it's falling away. It's falling off the cliff. So you might say, okay, give me some good news. Here's some good news. In the face of what's happening today, we need to be ready to stand firm in the truth. And you might say, well, how do I do that? Let me give you two practical ways that you and I can stand firm in the face of truth decay. The first one simply is this. We need to be saved by the truth. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in speaking again about those who are being deceived, he also points to the way of salvation. Look at what he says in verse 10. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. If we follow the wickedness, it'll deceive us. It'll take us away from the truth. He says they perish because why? Because they weren't educated enough? Because they refuse. Notice what it says next to... Love the truth and to be saved. To love the truth, be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. We'll get into that. You'll say, why did God do that? Notice that they first made the concrete, clear choice to reject the truth. And then this man of lawlessness brings about this final delusion. And he says, they will be condemned. Why? All of those who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. We need to love the truth. We need to say, oh God, give me your truth. I want to feast upon your truth. We need to know that we are saved by it. Look at what he says as he continues in verse 13. He says, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God shows you his first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. How is anyone saved today? Through the work of the Spirit, through the sanctifying work, the setting apart work of the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, who comes and speaks to us and convicts us of our need of a Savior. But we believe what? The objective truth. This objective truth that has been handed down from the Apostle Paul, through the Apostles, through the church, to all generations, to us today. We believe that rock-solid truth we say, I know that the world around me considers it a fable, but I believe the truth that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am a sinner, and I call upon this Savior to save me because I believe the truth of God's Word. It is God's initiative. God loved us. God calls us, right? The Bible teaches that, but the Bible also teaches that we must respond. We must love the truth. We must Believe in the truth to be saved. What does it mean to believe the truth? Let me give you an example. Let's say, and, and this is a, you know, a hard example, but let's say you go to the doctor. And the doctor says, I've got bad news for you. You've got a sickness. So sometimes we have to hear the bad news first, right? Truth sometimes can be blunt. Just like sin, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. doctor says, you're sick. But I have a cure for you. If you'll take these pills for 30 days straight without fail at 9.13 a.m. every day. Because that's how it works. 
you will be healed. Now, let me ask you, do you believe the doctor? You go home and you tell your spouse, I believe the doctor. The doctor told me the truth. And then your spouse says, so are you going to take the pills? I'm not sure. Do you believe the truth of the doctor's word? You might, you might intellectually think the doctor is very good. He may have graduated from Harvard. But unless and until you believe and assent to the truth that's been delivered to you and appropriated for yourself, you have not actually been saved by the truth. The doctor's word and promise will not be realized unless and until you believe with your head, with your heart, and with your hands and feet by grabbing the pill and taking the pill. Belief in Jesus is, involves our whole selves, just like belief in this doctor, to be saved by the truth. Have you believed the truth of Scripture to be saved? The Bible calls us to that kind of saving faith. And the Bible says that when we're saved by the truth, we can also be strengthened by the truth. To be strengthened by the church, tr truth is the theme of 2 Thessalonians. And again, we come to our theme verse in verse 15. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast. To what? To the latest opinion in the community? To the latest meme on Facebook? Hold fast to what? To the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Now, in those days, they didn't have the written scripture yet, so Paul's word was as good as the word of God, but now those words have been inscripturated. They've been put in writing. We have the finished New Testament and Old Testament. We have the Bible, the word of God. How will we stand firm? by listening to and obeying the truth of God's word. That's how we stand firm. To the word of God. And then Paul says in a prayer, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and grace of our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. So in other words, may Christ himself strengthen you and help you may he himself do it because you've believed in him and what happens you're encouraging your hearts and strengthening yourself in every good deed and word it's not just enough to believe the truth it's it requires us to stake our lives upon it to act upon it and to proclaim it to others again back to that analogy of the doctor unless and until i act upon the truth and take the pill which will bring me healing and then tell others all about this miraculous doctor who saved my life do i really believe it so too the bible says that we can be strengthened by the truth by acting upon it believing it loving it and acting upon it let me let me bring this to conclusion i've been been saying in times of truth decay we can stand firm how by being saved by how? By loving and believing the truth. Have you loved? Do you love? Do you believe the truth? Are you getting the truth within you? Are you allowing that truth to, to build up in you, to swell up in you so that you can truly believe what God has said about you and your life and your destiny in Jesus Christ? And are you ready to be strengthened by the truth, to stand firm until Christ comes? So I want to ask you to do one of two things today. To ask yourself today, in what ways am I allowing the truth of God's word to get inside of me? And is there something that I can practically do to allow God's truth to get into me more? Is there an active step? Maybe it's, it's reading the Bible more regularly, but maybe it's just taking you know, a couple of minutes each day to get God's word within you. 
Maybe it's coming out to a Bible study, a women's study, a men's study, you know, in a group setting. I, I'm just saying, what is it that God is calling you to do? Because without a proper truth intake, we won't be able to be strengthened. Then I want to ask you, in what ways will you stand for the truth? That might mean, you know, saying something sometime. Saying, I love you, I appreciate you, but I see it differently. Lovingly, speaking the truth to a culture that has abandoned the truth. Let's pray. God, we come before you today and I uh, ask that if there be anyone here who has, by the Spirit of God, discovered today that they have not truly believed the truth of Jesus Christ and His Word, but that through the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, you have felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you say, I know that I need to turn from sin and turn from falsehood and believe the truth to be saved. I ask you to, to just, in your heart, to speak that truth right now and say, Oh, Jesus, I am a sinner. And I have believed the falsehood that I'm okay as I am, but no, I now know I need a Savior. I turn to Jesus and receive Him as my Savior and Lord even today. I know that He died on the cross for my sins. I know He was raised from the dead. I know He's coming again. And I receive Him as Lord. And I, and I ask You to give me the strength to stand firm in this day to serve Him. Pray, Lord, that you would help us all to stand firm. We acknowledge that we fall short of your glory, and so we confess our sins to you. We know you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We ask for those who are sick that you would bring healing, for those who are discouraged that you would encourage, for those who need your provision that you would provide. We yield ourselves to you by the power of the Holy Spirit, Help us to stand firm until, until you call us to be with you, whether in the air or through our lives. We give the glory to you as we stand firm on the truth with the strength you give us in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.